Hi everyone, welcome into the webinar today. I'm here, this, I'm Stacy, and I'm here with my colleague Christian. And today we're gonna to talk to you about monitoring kinetics with uh, viscosity measurements. So let's go ahead and just get right into it. So just as some quick background, um, so you understand, uh, so we're, I'm gonna start here with some quick background so you understand the, the nature of these experiments and why they're informative and, and interesting. So the fluid microstructure can evolve over time for certain types of materials. And by fluid microstructure, I'm talking about everything from the nature of the individual components, like the macromolecules, for example, um, up to how these components are arranged. So it's basically everything describing the nature of what's happening on the microscopic level. And so this can evolve over time. And so this is what we mean by kinetics. The evolution of the structure, whether it's the individual molecule or the arrangement of them as a function of time. And this can occur for a variety of reasons. Um, this could be bond, covalent bond formation or breakage. Um, or it could be uh, driven by physical interaction. So self-assembly driven by you know, an attraction uh, perhaps, for example. So if you have an aggregation process in say a colloid or a protein that occurs over an extended period of time, this would be some self-assembly driven by these physical interactions. And so this type of structural evolution, independent of the, the cause or you know, lying, underlying reason behind it, will have some characteristic time scale over which it occurs. Um, and this could be a fraction of a second, so milliseconds, or it could be up to months or in some instances, even years. There's, depending on the nature of this evolution and the, the situation, it can last um, almost indefinitely. Now, uh, with that in mind, let's now think about viscosity and how viscosity could come in uh, and be used to characterize these types of systems. So viscosity is highly sensitive to the microstructure. Um, and by that, again, I mean the, the nature of the molecules, the interactions, and the spatial arrangement that, that comes about. And the viscosity measurement itself will also have some characteristic time scale. And in general, if you're doing a fairly simple, straightforward measurement, which is what we would use to try to monitor kinetics, um, the individual measurement time is going to be on the order of seconds, maybe at most minutes. Um, there are exceptions to this if you're doing some extremely low shear rates or low frequency rheology measurements, then those could be quite lengthy, um, but that's not what we're interested in doing here. So with that in mind, if you think, you know, if, you're, if you have a system that is evolving over time, whether it be bond formation or cleavage or some sort of self-assembly, um, and this characteristic length or time scale associated with this process is long compared to the measurement time, then our viscosity measurements can provide essentially a snapshot in time. So each of our measurements is, sh the time scale is short enough such that nothing is changing too dramatically during the, the time of the measurement. And so we're getting this snapshot in time. And we can use this type of measurement then when these conditions are met, when these uh, different time scales are um, drastically different to basically monitor the kinetics. And the other bonus with the viscosity is that you know, if you're dealing with something like this bond formation or bond breakage, viscosity, um, if you're doing it in the right concentration regime, can lead to intrinsic viscosity, which can lead to uh, molecular weight. So then that could be another means of quantifying what's happening uh, over time with the kinetic process. So we have in the past um, presented data where we were monitoring uh, process um, and trying to quantify the kinetics of this process. In this case, it was over a pretty uh, long time period. So we were looking at protein aging or storage stability. Um, and this particular experiment, set of experiments rather, we were looking at a model protein, bovine gamma globulin, um, at a fairly elevated concentration. And we were storing these proteins uh, in the refrigerator at 4C, which is typically how you would store uh, biological materials or therapeutics. And we would measure the viscosity over the course of seven weeks. So this is a very, obviously, this is a very long time scale compared to our measurement time, which would be, as I said, seconds to minutes for each individual data point. And so we were able to monitor the change in viscosity as a function of time up to nearly seven weeks. 
And this allowed us to identify a stability window for these materials and then also start to quantify the rate and magnitude of change that we saw with time. So this was an example of monitoring a kinetic process on a much longer time scale. So let's now talk about what the focus, um, so the focus of today's talk then is gonna shift things a bit and we're gonna see if we can use our technology, the BRAC technology, which we'll review in a short time, to monitor something that's happening on a faster time scale. So not weeks, but perhaps say hours or you know minutes. So that's really going to be the more the focus of today's talk is you know using our technology to monitor a process that's on a shorter time scale than that you know weeks of the stability of the proteins. So our case study today is going to uh, relate to guargon degradation. And so I just wanted to give a quick backstory as to why we're looking at the degradation of guargum. So we kind of needed to look into this process for a very practical reason. We were um, we recently have introduced a extensional flow channel that's compatible with our Initium, which is our automated system. And to basically help out our newest customer with this um, flow channel, we were trying to clean out their samples from our, our, our extensional chip. And they were potentially interested in guar gum and other types of polysaccharides, which are common thickeners in a variety of industries. So we, we found that we were when we were trying to use our original cleaning protocols, which typically would use a buffer solution as the primary solvent to flush the sample out, and generally this is done at room temperature, um, we were leaving a lot of these uh, this guar gum behind in our flow channel. So this is a, a zoomed in image of our extensional chip where we have um, all of this left behind, this gunk in our chip. So what we found is if you go and you look into the literature, what you can find is that polysaccharides um, will degrade when you have acidic conditions. Generally, this is something less than a pH of about 2.5. And when you elevate the temperature. So this is starting the, above, say, uh, body temperature, which is about 37C and above. So we, we found this out and we took advantage of this to clean up the mess that we we're presenting here on the top image. So we developed a cleaning protocol where we used a 10% acetic acid solution at the elevated temperatures to clear all of that out. So this kind of got us interested on this degradation process. So it's, it's a very, very um, practical application of it. And then it also introduced us to something that we wanted to see if we can challenge ourselves and use our technology to, to actually monitor this process. So that was the question we asked, you know, can we monitor the degradation of the guar gum at elevated temperatures under acidic conditions, and then also use the viscosity measurements to extract a molecular weight so we can see how molecular weight um, might be dropping as a function of time. So that's kind of the backstory as to why we started to look at this particular type of measurement. Okay, so just a quick overview of our technology um, for anyone who's not familiar, and then it also allows me to point out why our instrumentation is um, quite suitable for the situation that I just described. So we're looking at basically taking a sample where we're going to be doing uh, measurements over extended period of time at elevated temperatures. So, you know, if you have something that has, that's an open system that has an air fluid interface, then anything, anytime you have these elevated temperatures, even if you're dealing with aqueous samples, then you have a lot of issues with, um, evaporation. So that's not going to be an issue for our technology, uh, our VROC technology, viscometer, rheometer on a chip. So this is microfluidics and MEMS based. We have a microfluidic flow channel where we have pressure sensors spaced across the base of the channel. We control the flow rate through the channel and monitor the pressure drop across the channel. And we use these two properties, our controlled flow rate and our pressure drop across the channel to calculate shear rate and stress and then calculate shear viscosity. So for this type of uh, measurement, we use that core technology um, in all of our instrumentation and our measurements today were performed on our automated system, which is our VROC Initium 1 Plus. So I'm not gonna go over all the details of this. I just wanted to sort of highlight the features that were relevant to our measurements today. And to sort of reiterate that, that's the fact that our system is closed. We, we don't have any air fluid interface. Um, 
related to the measurement region. And so we can basically, and we have high quality Peltier temperature control of both the test syringe and the flow channel. Um, so this is sort of the bird's eye view of our system. Our sample would be automatically loaded into our test syringe, and then we would um, control the flow rate of the fluid into the flow channel, which is in this region here, which is what we refer to as the chip. And this is sort of contained in this closed environment. The only interface is a small uh, air fluid interface at the exit tubing here, which never, um, again, once it's out here, re-enters the channel. So this is all enclosed in our Peltier temperature control region, and we can, once the sample is loaded, it's in this system for as long as we want to do our measurements, um, and we're not worried about evaporation, and we have temperature control of both our sample in the syringe and our sample in the chip. So everything is controlled in a similar manner. So it kind of sets it up as an ideal case for these types of uh, experiments where we're looking at this thermal degradation of the guar gum. Okay, so that's sort of the, um, the background and the layout of what we're gonna talk about. So now I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague Christian and he's gonna go over um, the details of the experiments and start sharing some data with you. Uh, thank you very much, Stacey. Uh, so the goal that we had was to show how <clears throat> the initium can look into this thermal degradation of uh, acidic guar gum solutions uh, for extended periods of time. Uh, so when doing so, we had uh, a couple of challenges. Uh, number one, we had to adequately dissolve the guar gum into the DI water. And number two, uh, we had to remove any visible fibers from the solution. So we wanted to do this because these fibers uh, may clog up the chip flow channel. So we experimented uh, with varying the heating time um, at 80 degrees Celsius. And we found that the solution uh, viscosity doesn't really change if you heat the solution for more than uh, like two hours. So because of this, we prepared the solutions by heating the guar gum and DI water mixture to this 80 degrees for about two to three hours. Now to remove the visible fibers and any large um, uh, particles, aggregates that may have clogged the flow channel, we then filtered um, the solutions. Uh, so we did this at room temperature with a nylon syringe filter and the pore size uh, about five microns. Afterwards, we added a small amount of hydrochloric acid to the solutions, and this was to drop their pH. And because it was only about two drops that we added uh, to the solution, didn't really affect much the concentration of these um, of the guar gum. Now the viscosity of each solution was measured with the Initium One Plus and the BO5 chip. So uh, just a reminder, BO5 chip has the depth of 50 microns and the maximum pressure of around 42 kilopascal. Now we measured this viscosity for about 100 segments or 100 repeats uh, for each sample at a specific uh, elevated temperature. Uh, we then set the pause time between each measurement to about 60 seconds. And we did this so that we would uh, have viscosity measurements that pretty much spanned over uh, multiple hours. Uh, for all these measurements, we used a flow rate of about uh, 500 microliters per minute. And this corresponds roughly to about 9,000 inverse seconds. Now about uh, 70 microliters of the sample was loaded and we selected the retrieval function. Uh, and this is so that uh, we could um, perform all segments with only one loaded volume. Uh, after all the measurements were complete, uh, we used the PBS buffer, 1% aquat, and um, IPA as the three uh, cleaning solvents in that, uh, in that order. So this uh, thermal degradation uh, process for these acidic guar gum solutions, this occurs over uh, multiple hours. Uh, so we can monitor that by measuring the, the corresponding decrease in viscosity over time. So here in the y-axis, 
uh, of this uh, plot, we have defined the relative uh, apparent viscosity. Uh, we've defined that as the viscosity divided by the viscosity at uh, time equals zero, or the initial viscosity. Uh, the y, uh, the x-axis uh, is for the time at which these acidic guargum samples were exposed to the elevated temperature. So it could be 50, 60, or 70 degrees Celsius. Uh, so each data point uh, that you see here corresponds to a different um, uh, segment or repeat that uh, was run on the, on the initium. So these plots, uh, all these plots that you see here, they, these correspond to, diff, um, to different pH values and temperatures for solutions that are 0.58% guar gum. So we used uh, two pH values, uh, 1.48 and 2.12, and three temperatures, 50, 60, and 70. So you can see from, this, uh, from the plots here that there's a decrease in this viscosity uh, relative viscosity uh, with time for all these samples. And this is indicating that the guargum molecules uh, degraded with time uh, for all the samples. So we can see here that for the solution with the pH of 2.12 that was elevated to uh, 50 degrees, which is uh, this shown here, uh, this uh, viscosity drops from about one, this relative viscosity, to about uh, roughly 0.9. So it's about a 10% decrease. But if we now look at a solution with a lower pH, uh, so 1.48, that's elevated to an even higher temperature. Uh, so that would be um, 70 degrees. This drop would be uh, a lot more drastic. So if you look at... Um, this plot here corresponding to the lowest pH and temperature we studied, um, there's a roughly about 80% drop in the relative viscosity. So much higher than that uh, previous 10%. So our results pretty much suggest that there's this enhanced degradation of the guargon polymer and the solutions with the lower pH and uh, higher temperatures. And this uh, degradation is uh, even more apparent for solutions with temperatures greater than like 60 degrees. Uh, so the researchers have previously looked at the relative viscosity of dilute uh, guar gum solutions with uh, these low pH values and elevated temperatures. And a difference between our methods um, and and theirs is that they only show a maximum of 11 viscosity measurements uh, over multiple hours, whereas we take um, about 100 measurements. Um, but on the other hand, we see that there's a similar drop in viscosity over time. And this becomes uh, more pronounced with uh, this decrease in pH and increase in temperature. So now I will uh, hand it back over to Stacy. Okay, thanks, Christian. Um, so now that we've seen that we can, in fact, um, so just quick recap here. So we we know that this you know degradation process and taking advantage of it allowed us to clear out our flow channel that you had seen had been quite clogged up there. And now Christian's experiments have indicated that we can, you know, systematically monitor this process um, as a function of time in our instrument um, for. Um, these specific samples under different uh, pH values and temperatures. And so now uh, what's the next step? The next step would be to what, what else can we extract from that data? Because we always like to take the as much advantage of our data as we possibly can. And so early on, uh, earlier on today, I had mentioned that viscosity um, in the dilute regime, dilute solution regime, um, can be used to calculate the intrinsic viscosity. And then ultimately this intrinsic viscosity can be used to estimate a molecular weight. So then the overall goal would be to take data similar to what Christian had just presented to you um, and do the intrinsic viscosity analysis to then monitor what the molecular weight change might be as a function of the degradation process, as a function of time. So just to remind you what intrinsic viscosity is, 
um, and how we're going to calculate it, and then tell you how we're going to calculate it today for our um, for the next portion of the talk. So intrinsic viscosity is basically uh, doing a series of viscosity measurements on um, a series of dilute solutions. Um, that's the full analysis, um, and then in a moment here we'll talk about how we can simplify that to just a single point or a single concentration. So what's the, the backstory here for the intrinsic viscosity? So we're looking at these dilute concentrations. So the, the benefit of doing anything in the dilute limit is that the theory is, theory is always easier to handle. And in the case of a dilute concentration series, we can model the data um, with basically what's referred to as the Huggins coefficient. And so this is a power law expansion of the relative viscosity in terms of concentration of, in this case, gorgum. And in this case, the relative viscosity, what I'm referring to is slightly different than what Christian mentioned a moment ago, where he was looking at the time relative viscosity. I'm talking about the viscosity of the gorgum solutions relative to that of the solvent, which in this case is, is just water. And so the full analysis, what you would do is prepare samples of multiple concentrations and measure all of those and then analyze that data to basically extract out the intrinsic viscosity parameter. And so the intrinsic viscosity parameters, parameter is just a defined parameter. It's the first order, it's the prefactor in the first order term of the expansion. So what, what does that term mean? Why is that relevant to us now? And why would that relate to molecular weight? So because it's the first order term in the expansion in this uh, limit of infinite dilution, it's really, um, uh, expressing what's happening in this state where you have molecules that are very far um, spaced far apart. So they're not interacting with each other. So the nature of this term, because these molecules are so far apart and they're not really interacting at this point, is to describe the individual behavior. So this and the main feature here is going to be basically size and shape of the molecule. So one of the things obviously influencing the size is the molecular weight. Although in general, it could relate to other things such as solvent quality, which would influence the intermolecular interactions and the structure of the actual molecule. So that's the um, parameter that we're gonna focus on here. Um, not so much the higher order terms where we start looking at interactions. We're really looking at this first order term and how to use that to quantify the nature of the molecules. Because in this case, um, what we see is that the, we're having the um, breakdown of the molecules under these particular conditions. So, as I mentioned, the full analysis, you would basically sort of re, um, rearrange these equations, either the Huggins equations or the alternative Kramer equation, and then look at the limit um, as concentration goes to zero, and that, in the end, would basically be that intercept. Um, that's really not convenient for us in this particular type of experiment, because we don't want to have um, a series of concentrations that we have to monitor the viscosity over the course of hours and then try to apply this analysis. That's not convenient in this case. So you can actually do what is referred to as the single point analysis or basically measurement at a single concentration. And I'm not going to go through it today, but um, you can actually derive with the most common relationship used for the single point, point analysis from the Huggins and Kramer equation. So if you're interested in seeing how this final equation down here, the Solomon um, C2, C2, I don't know how to say that, uh, equation uh, comes about, you can check out some of our previous application notes. So I think it's an application note from November where we um, presented data on intrinsic viscosity data on polycaprolactone um, samples. So you can actually derive this single point relationship um, from the two equations used for the full um, analysis. And basically in this case now, we can get the intrinsic viscosity by doing, by getting the relative viscosity at one single concentration. So that was what we um, did here. So we, we really wanted just to simplify this and use one concentration, not a series of them. Okay, so then how does that take us to the molecular weight? So how does intrinsic viscosity lead to some molecular weight estimation? So it's empirically known, um, and so you can go look in a, a number of uh, textbooks or something like the Polymer Handbook, um, and you know 
realize that this it's empirically well established that intrinsic viscosity will generally behave um, or relate to the molecular weight with some power law behavior. And these coefficients, either the prefactor or this power law coefficient, are going to depend, they're going to be specific to a particular polymer solvent system. Um, and this uh, power law coefficient A is generally going to indicate, indicate the solvent quality for that particular polymer. So for example, if you have a polymer that's in what is referred to as a theta solvent, so this is that kind of ideal state, the theta solvent, if you're not familiar, where basically interactions between segments and interactions between the segment and the solvent molecules are basically equivalent, and you end up with some sort of Gaussian coil type structure. Um, so in that case, it's pretty well established that this is going to be about 0.5. And for something like a good solvent, it's going to be larger than that because in that particular state, the molecule will be more swollen or more expanded um, because it's more preferential um, or more energy or energetically favorable for those uh, polymer segments to be surrounded by solvent molecules. And so you can often find these values in the literature for common polymer systems. So either a specific publication or perhaps if you're something really common you can go to a source such as the polymer handbook or the equivalent and find these for a variety of systems and so you know if you can find those in the literature then you can use your intrinsic viscosity measurement to get some sort of average molecular weight estimation for your your samples so in the case of the guar gum um, we were able to find these values in the literature and then use our single point intrinsic viscosity data to actually estimate the molecular weight as a function of time as the degradation process um, played out. So I'm gonna give it back to Christian now and he's going to share with you um, this data and the calculations. Uh, thank you very much, Stacy. <clears throat> so for these measurements, we use the Initium One Plus so to measure the viscosity and to calculate the molecular weight of the acidic uh, guar gum solutions. So this was done uh, over uh, multiple, several hours at uh, several uh, elevated temperatures. So we prepared uh, two guar gum solutions with the same concentration of guar gum, 0.07 weight percent. And this concentration is more dilute than the concentration for the previous measurements we showed. Uh, and this is more appropriate for the single point intrinsic viscosity measurements. So again, uh, we mix the guar gum and DA water and heated them to 80 degrees for two to three hours. And it's like before we filtered at room temperature um, and then added a, a small amount of uh, hydrochloric acid uh, to drop the pH to about 1.6. And again, this didn't affect the concentration of guar gum much, the, addi the addition of uh, hydrochloric acid. So for the measurements, we used a BO35 chip. Uh, so this one has a depth of 35 uh, micro microns uh, and a maximum pressure of around 40, 42 kilopascal. And we measured and averaged the viscosity for each set of about five to 15 segments uh, using a flow rate of uh, 800 microliters per minute. So this is about 30 K um, inverse seconds. And these measurements were carried out at room temperature or at 25 C. So between each set of measurements uh, at 25 C, uh, the temperature was elevated to either 50 degrees or 70 degrees for about 10 to 14 minutes. So basically the temperature was kept at 25, increased to degrade the guar gum, uh, and then drop to 25 for the next set of measurements, and then elevate it again to degrade once more, and then so on, uh, rinse and repeat. So as you can imagine, um, the Initium automatically uh, made all these measurements over uh, many hours. So because we needed so many measurements for each sample, we used the sample retrieval function as well. And for the cleaning of the flow pads uh, after the measurements, uh, we used a PBS buffer, a one person aquid solution, and acetone. So we used those solvents uh, in that order. 
So here are the viscosity results for our acidic uh, dilute uh, guar gum samples. So these were taken at 25 degrees C, as I mentioned. And between uh, these measurements, one sample was elevated to uh, 50 degrees C, so the, uh, shown by these purple tr uh, triangles, while the other one was elevated to 70 C, uh, and that's shown by these uh, uh, squares. So here the x-axis is the time that the sample is, uh, had previously spent at its um, elevated temperature before the measurement um, was taken at 25. So we can see that the samples um, were exposed to these elevated temperatures for about seven to up to nine hours. So to repeat myself from the previous slide, each viscosity um, value is the average of five to 15 segments measurements and the error bars, uh, these correspond to the standard deviation. So nearly all these, uh, all the error bars uh, are smaller than the size of these symbols. So this is showing a uh, high accuracy that we got with the initium uh, for these very dilute samples, you know, small viscosity dilute samples. The initial viscosity for both of these samples is about 1.4 sending point. And this viscosity would decrease with uh, time for both samples. So that's a similarity between both and that's indicating um, the quargum degradation in solution. Now the solution that's elevated to 50 degrees, uh, this one drops to a viscosity of around 1.2, 1.25, um, up to time of about 430 or so minutes. Now on the other hand, uh, the solution that uh, we elevated to 70 degrees, um, for the same time range, this one drops to about 1, 1.05, so this one has about double the rate of decrease. And so this is indicating that increasing the, um, the elevated temperature is leading to a larger drop in viscosity. And this is due to um, uh, this um, enhanced degradation of the gorgon. So we can show this degradation of gorgon. <clears throat> um, by obtaining the molecular weights through the single point intrinsic viscosity analysis <clears throat> uh, that um, uh, Stacy was um, introduced. So just to give a um, recap, we, we use this uh, equation shown on top, the Solomon equation, to calculate the um, <clears throat> intrinsic viscosity for each viscosity value that we showed in the previous slide. And then we convert it. Um, um, so to do this, we have to convert the viscosity to the relative viscosity uh, by dividing by the solvent viscosity. And then that relative viscosity is shown here as uh, eta sub r. So now because it's a single point intrinsic viscosity analysis, we only need one concentration, um, <clears throat> which is input here in the denominator. And this concentration is 0.07 weight percent, as I mentioned in the previous slide. So this uh, expression, um, the Solomon expression, um, if you want to learn more um, about it, uh, look at uh, the derivation for it. Uh, that derivation is shown in uh, one of our previous application notes. And uh, the title for that uh, application note uh, is um, I think it's single point intrinsic viscosity analysis of uh, polycaprolactone chloroform solutions. So you can look at that and look at the derivation. So then with the intrinsic viscosity, knowing the intrinsic viscosity, we calculated the molecular weight by using this uh, Mark Hoving um, equation that Stacy introduced earlier as well. And we used the pre-factor as well as the exponent values from, um, from the literature for um, a, guar gum a guar gum sample that's um, at 25 degrees C. So pretty much our conditions. So with these uh, molecular uh, weight values in hand, we can uh, went ahead and plot it. The reciprocal of molecular weight, so inverse of molecular weight as a function of time at the elevated temperature. 
So this x-axis is um, the same um, as the x-axis from the previous learn. So for the brown circles, the elevated temperature is 70 degrees, whereas for these uh, bluish, greenish, teal colored diamonds, it's about um, that elevated temperature is 50 degrees. So for the two samples, there's this rise in inverse molecular weight with time. So that's um, indicating uh, quark gram degradation with time. And this uh, inverse molecular weight, uh, you can clearly see that it rises more rapidly for this solution elevated to 70 degrees. And this is showing the enhanced degradation of quark gram at the higher temperatures that, um, like we saw in the previous slide. So we plot this uh, y-axis as inverse molecular weight uh, instead of just molecular weight because we also want to um, study the kinetics of this quark gram degradation. So you can see here the dashed lines <clears throat> that uh, are uh, superimposed into the two, um, the two plots. And this is um, showing that there's this uh, linear relationship between the inverse molecular weights and the time. And this is the case for both temperatures, uh, as you can see. And it's uh, suggestion, uh, suggesting that the degradation follows a first order kinetics. And uh, it was previous, de previously described as uh, being random uh, with respect to chain cleavage. So pretty. Uh, so the rate of reaction uh, is depending on this concentration of the undergraded uh, polymer chains. So this linear relationship has previously been observed uh, and published in the literature, but only for um, uh, guar gum uh, degradation at temperatures only up to 50 degrees C. And it's also important to note that um, the initial molecular weight in the literature is different from ours. And this may be due to differences um, in the source of the of the gorgon between theirs and ours. So I will uh, go ahead and hand it um, back to Stacy. <clears throat> Thank you, Christian. Um, so just to quickly summarize before we give everybody the opportunity to ask some questions. Um, so we just wanted to highlight that you know we came a across this practical um, situation of the degradation of the guar gum where we used it to clean clean things out. And then it gave us, sort of inspired us to see if we could uh, monitor some kinetics that occurred on a, a shorter time scale than we had in the past. So in the past, we had done this type of, uh, you know, protein aging and protein stability. Um, so we used this with our R1+. Um, so we're able to do this over the multiple hours I guess it depended on the, the concentration of the guar gum. So the more dilute ones we monitored for a longer period of time. Um, so we did see this decrease in viscosity that we, we would expect as the covalent bonds were broken. And um, depending on the conditions, uh, whether it was more acidic or higher temperatures, we saw you know, more or less um, reduction in viscosity. Um, so we were able to do a, a single point um, intrinsic viscosity measurement and use that to estimate uh, sort of how the molecular weight would be trending over the course of the de degradation. Um, and so this, you know, has been, you know, quite uh, a good application of our tool because, you know, we were doing these things at elevated temperatures for extended periods of time um, without concern of, you know, inconsistencies in temperature of the sample and then also um, any sort of evaporation. So um, with that, uh, we'll go over to the questions section and see if we have any questions. So as we await for anything to come in, um, I'll just mention that, uh, you know, if you'd, anyone who signed up for the webinar will get a recording at some point. Um, and then the, the slides will become available if you're interested in reviewing things again. So if you don't have um, a question at this time, but you think of one later, um, please you know, contact us. You'll have contact information because you did in fact sign up.
And I would also comment that um, any of our uh, users out there uh, who are using Initium, and if you are having some challenges with cleaning, um, also please contact us because sometimes you know we can come up with creative ways as we've kind of described here earlier on to handle some tough samples that might be difficult there. So we'd be happy to work with anyone um, having challenges cleaning out their uh, their flow channels um, to find a way to do it. All right, well, I think we'll, we're gonna end it today. Um, so thanks everyone for uh, joining us and we will have our upcoming webinar in May. We have one every month. So just to sort of advertise for that, um, May's webinar is going to talk about some materials that are commonly used in uh, bio ink printing applications. So these are things like sodium alginate, carrageenan, um, hyaluronic acid. So a variety of materials that are relevant to that type of work. So that would be the May webinar at the end of May. So you'll see an advertisement um, for that uh, sometime early on in the month and uh, you'll have the opportunity to sign up and join for that. So thanks again for joining us and uh, hope you'll come back um, in May. Thank you very much.